Coming up, from puppets to birdies, we have high drama from Topeka to Jefferson City. And there's plenty of drama closer to home. Is it going, going, not gone? And is he in? Week in Review is made possible through the generous support of Dave and Jamie Cummings, Bob and Marlee Scorley, Smithfield Foods, Haas and Wilkerson Insurance, the Courtney S. Turner Charitable Trust, John H. Mize and Bank of America N.A. co-trustees, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome everyone, I'm Nick Haynes, and we are pouring through the news of the week in this place we call home, lifting up the hood on the week's most impactful headlines. He is Mr. Up to Date on KCUR-FM, Steve Kraske. From the Call newspaper, senior writer Eric Wesson from KCTV 5 News, reporter Caroline Sweeney, and the co-moderator of the first mayoral debate from KCMO Talk Radio, Pete Mundo. This is supposed to be, by the way, baseball season, so why is it that the biggest headlines have absolutely nothing to do with the Royals, but with our off-season NFL team. If there was one event many people in our metro anticipated this week, it was the Kansas City Chiefs making a definitive announcement on the future of one of their biggest and most controversial stars. It didn't happen. In fact, player Tyreek Hill going on the offense and through his attorney, refuting that he ever abused his three-year-old son and was emphatic that there is more evidence yet to be made public so, Caroline Sweeney, is that a reason why, despite being pulled from team activities, despite the fact that the Johnson County DA has reopened the criminal case, case against him, that Tyreek Hill remains, as we record this program, a Kansas City chief? I think what we're going to have to keep watching uh, coming up in the future, especially in the next few weeks, once um, the OTAs really start to play out, is how the Chiefs handle this. This could be the opportunity that they've been looking for, despite everything we've been seeing playing out in the courtrooms and in our newsroom at Channel 5. Um, that could be their opportunity to make a move. Last fall, Kareem Hunt, another pl uh, Chiefs player, when was seen recorded on video uh, kicking a woman at a hotel in Cleveland. Within hours, he's no longer with the team. What is the difference with this case? You got the video, Nick. I mean, that's what it comes down to. You have video, and, and with this story, you have a massive gray area. And I think the Chiefs, too, are looking at what happened with Hunt. They cut him. Yes, he's got a few game suspension, but he's playing for somebody else. I think the Chiefs are also waiting for the NFL to step in and maybe levy some type of suspension or ban, whether it's a year, two years, whatever it might be, and then they might make a move. But they're hesitant to say, let's get rid of one of the best wide receivers in the NFL uh, at potentially our detriment if he signs with somebody else. Is there a backlash in any way to the Chiefs over this, Steve? I, I'm not sure there is yet, Nick, but if by in some strange way he would remain a Chief going into the regular season or even the preseason, then I think a lot of people in town would sort of erupt. I think Pete makes a good point. I think there's a certain sense of mystery here. We don't really know what's going on. The best guess that I'm hearing is, is that the NFL, the Chiefs are waiting for the NFL to make a move here, then the Chiefs can and, uh, fill in and, and make their uh, make their cut, but I can't believe that he will be a chief come preseason. Eric, I'm surprised he's lasted this long. Just the allegation, I, you know, who broke the child's arm? I think it's one thing, but I think the threatening statement about she should be afraid of him as well. I thought that would be the straw that broke the camel's back. But again, as let's see how this plays out because the gray area is who did break his arm she admitted to spanking him he admitted i didn't do anything and then his lawyer statement so i think it's uh the story thickens the plot thickens because the of the audio that was provided and broadcast on kctv5 the johns county da did reopen the case in this some people i've seen on social media though say why why didn't channel 5 release that to the johnson county da before that did you hold on to that video well, I'm, I'm going to be clear about this. Angie Ricono and Emily Sinovic are very capable reporters and investigators, and I was in no way involved in the decision making. Um, I hadn't I didn't even know we had the audio tape. I didn't hear it before we broadcast this. So those decisions were made by Angie, Emily, our assistant news director, and our, our news director. But what I, what I will tell you is um, that we are not in the business of um, making a show out of things. Um, Angie talked to her sources, um, and when she got the go-ahead from her sources, like she told everyone um, in our report, that's when they released the tape. 
The Johnson County, uh, let's move on to another story here, which is going to continue on our week in review. We're going to head next to the uh, Kansas Capitol, where state lawmakers uh, returned after a three-week break to wrap up their legislative session. And they're doing so with plenty of high drama and brawls over abortion and the biggest priority on new Governor Laura Kelly's wish list, and that's Medicaid expansion. This week, her quest failed by one vote. Lawmakers had been trying to extend Medicaid coverage to families of four earners up to $35,000 a year. That would be coverage to about 130,000 more people. If the federal government is willing to pick up 90% of the cost and states pick up only 10%, what is the reluctance of lawmakers to move forward with this, Pete? Uh, it's just the state's on the hook. Is the state going to be on the hook if the federal funds aren't there? I mean, we're running trillion-dollar deficits as is in D.C., so uh, depending on who's in charge of the House, the Senate, and the executive branch, if that money goes... The state's going to be on the hook, and that's the concern. Also, there have been so many independent studies done saying the actual health benefits for people that are using Medicaid is not there. So I think there's a legitimate argument on the money end, and also, what are the actual health benefits to being on these programs? They think it costs about $50 million a year, and if the federal government got out of this altogether in the future, which we don't know, um, they would be on the hook for everything, Steve. Well, that's the argument, Nick. And, you know, states adjust their Medicaid rates all the time. People are added, people are dropped from roles. And I think if the federal government were to back away substantially, states across the country would probably withdraw coverage as well. But, you know, to be sure, Nick, the, the, the support for Medicaid expansion in Kansas is, is growing uh, almost to overwhelming proportions here. The political pressure on Republicans who are resisting this continues to mount. Whether we get it done this year or not, I don't know. There'll be more attempts made next year very well could be the year if it doesn't happen now. Yeah, this is one of those cornerstone campaign issues that we've seen that divides the Republicans and the Democrats, especially in a state like Kansas. So you're when it comes down to if it's going to get done this year, I agree with Steve, it may not happen. We're in that veto session. It is crunch time right now in right. Topeka. Um, but it will play out for some of these Republicans. And you even saw Jim Denny, um, who had to he decided to take that pass vote. Um, whether or not he's thinking about election time, um, that could be the reason. And you spoke to him this week. Yeah, and Jim Denning made it very clear when I talked to him that, that he argued he was getting threatened by Governor Kelly on this front to basically say, vote for me on this, and I won't have a legitimate opponent go up against you uh, in 2020. And, and he made that very clear on the air. I reached out to Governor Kelly's team. They did not respond to that yet as of this recording. But, um, yeah, he was not thrilled with how this was being handled politically behind the scenes on his end. You know, just quickly, Nick, if Laura Kelly gets this win, this turns her legislative session from a pretty good session to a really good session, gives her a, a monumental achievement, if you will, to campaign on a few years down the road. This really sets her up. Well, last week, the Kansas Supreme Court, as we mentioned on this program, it was breaking news at the time. They ruled that the state constitution fundamentally would protect a woman's right to an abortion. So why was abortion also such a hot, contentious issue in Topeka this week? I'm assuming just because seven justices in black robes made their decision, it, it didn't settle things, Caroline. No, absolutely not. I sat down and spoke with Mary Kay Culp at Kansans for Life about this ruling and about this veto override issue that we saw happen, issue one, day one of the veto session. Um, and she's saying that they're still gearing up for a fight. Um, Kansans for Life is trying to figure out what to do next um, to make sure that they that people who um, are pro-life and who want to make sure um, that their views are heard have that opportunity in the future. And they could, you could be voting on it soon yourself on the ballot in 2020. They're looking now at a constitutional amendment uh, to counter the Supreme Court decision. Yeah, and, and Mary Kay Culpa talked to as well. And, and Jim Denning had the same approach, which is uh, we want to do this, but let's not rush it. So let's, they were looking at 2020 already. It looks like that was confirmed this week that this is going to be on the back burner until next legislative cycle. And I'm not surprised by it. Yes, they are obviously heavily pro-life, but they also want to make sure this is done right and done effectively. Just let me point out here, Nick, this is about politics. People are forgetting that adding a, a constitutional amendment uh, to uh, Kansas language is extremely difficult to do. You need two-thirds support in both houses to take it to a state constitutional convention or take it to a vote of the people. That is highly unlikely, given the number of Democrats and moderate Republicans in the legislature. I think what's getting set up here is a big fight uh, on abortion during the, uh, the, the elections next spring and next fall. 
fall to help Republicans win seats. Well, even with the numbers that we saw for the veto override, I mean, if you look at what happened in the Kansas House, they had 24 hours to try and find two more votes and they could not do Couldn't it. So it. if you want to look at abortion issues and how things are playing out in the state of Kansas, I think that veto override effort says a lot more than just what it did on the surface. The big news focus locally is on the Kansas City mayor's race, but there are tributes going on all across the city for the man who is about to leave the job in the next 90 days, Sly James. I got to be part of an unusual tribute to the man in charge at the Golden Ox. For the best part of eight years, he has led our metro's largest city. Tonight, he is our newsmaker guest right here at the Golden Ox in the heart of our city. Please welcome Mayor Sly James to the stage. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to play a medley of tuba tunes based on the things I love about Kansas City. Let's hit it. All right, here we go. Here we go. <clears throat> Something's not right. Hold on. It's like there's I, something stuck yeah, in the tube. I, I see the what? problem. I think what? we've got something oh. stuck in here. What is it? Let's tug this. Oh my gosh! Oh. Okay, let's see what this is here. What do you okay. have there? Reelect fun for mayor, 2011. Now, how did that end up in there? Yeah, I'm gonna sing. All right, you ready? Go eat some Jack Stack. Cheer on the Chiefs, Keith. Ride far on the street car. Just listen to me. We might not have mountains, but check out our fountains. Let's hear it for KC. We love our city. Thank you, everybody. All righty, Mayor Sly James, or at least as portrayed by the Mesner Puppet Company and its artistic director, Mike Horner. The big question, of course, now is uh, when the next Mesner Company makes its next puppet, uh, will it be of Jolie Justice or of Quinton Lucas? Six weeks before Election Day, Lucas is going public and accusing his opponent, by the way, of dirty politics. He claims an opposition researcher has been trying to pull his employment records at KU, where he teaches in the law school. And they've also been asking questions about his girlfriend and city council travel records. What's the Justice campaign's response to that, Steve? But there hasn't been much response that I've seen, Nick, and because there's no question the Justice campaign, according to a report by Mike Mahoney at Channel 9, uh, has indeed hired uh, a consultant to do some oppo research. But no one should be surprised by this, Nick. This is uh, politics 101. Every campaign of any size these days hires an opposition. I researcher. always think about right. it, though, perhaps at a U.S. Senate race or a congressional race, but at local politics like this, Eric? Yes. I mean, this is par for the course. Once you get into the arena of elected politics, there's no rules to that anymore. Uh, everything is open game. His attendance... And is he going to, and I think this is important to, to taxpayers to know, so is he going to be teaching or is he going to be running the city or governing the city? So people have a right to know that. Uh, some of the other things that I've seen go on in these campaigns, I question, but that's politics 101, like Steve said. Pete. <laughs> yeah, I think you look at this, this was the least shocking thing ever. I mean, to know that a <laughs> campaign was inspired, you know, looking into the other campaign and doing oppo research is par for the course. I think also interesting this week, Mayor Sly James took a bit of a shot at Quentin Lucas saying, don't fall for the smooth and the silk. I think that was also our friend Mike Mahoney. And, yes. you know, that was a clear shot. That was a clear shot at Quentin Lucas saying, uh, you're not the guy for the job. Uh, I had Sly on my show about a month ago, and one of the things that he talked about about his endorsement of Jolie was that he wanted to wanted somebody there that would make sure that the airport would get finished. One of the concerns that he has about Quentin is that he flip flops. This morning he's on one side of the street. Later this afternoon he might be on another side of the street, or he might stay at home. So I think he wanted somebody that was going to be consistent with carrying out some of the things that he's already been doing. You know, I thought this was a remarkable moment because uh, those of us who've been around here for a little bit will recall eight years ago when Sly James and Mike Burke squared off in the general election for mayor. That was the cleanest campaign. They they refused to go after each other on absolutely anything. I remember having the two of them on my radio show and saying, well, you know, Sly James, how would you compare yourself to Mike Burke on this issue? And he took great umbrage to that, that I was asking for them to go negative on each other. Now here we have Sly James eight years later going negative in this general election campaign for mayor, which says something important. It says perhaps he feels really strongly that uh, Quentin's not the right guy for mayor, or it suggests that he's concerned that Jolie's slipping behind in this race and he needs to reverse the mechanics of it. 
it. It was a moment. I think that's a huge part of it. I think he is deathly concerned that he is, Quinton is gaining some steam yes. in this thing. Uh, I don't think they saw it coming, to be honest. And and Quinton's message appears to be resonating in different parts of the city that, yeah. that the Justice campaign did not think it would. And all point. of this is happening even before the very first debate that takes place, by the way, on Monday night. It is a KCMO Talk Radio and KCTV 5 debate, 6.30 p.m., yes. simulcast on both of your stations. On Monday, Kansas Cityans gathered at the Nelson Atkins Museum to remember the life of one of Kansas City's biggest philanthropists, the man who put the H in h and Block. We can't mention the loss of Henry Block without acknowledging the death this week of another major philanthropist in Kansas City, Morton Sosland. If you're less familiar with his name, he brought to Kansas City one of the most iconic images we have, the oversized shuttlecocks on the Nelson lawn that was back in 1994. And while they're now one of the city's most endearing symbols, those humongous giant badminton birdies were loathed by many when they were introduced 25 years ago, Steve. You know, they were, Nick, and I remember the outcry against those things. And, you know, I have loved them from the start. And what a great symbol they are against this very staid, serious institution, the Nelson Atkins. This added a touch of whimsy. And you can argue that Kansas City has been better off ever since those things They landed. may have been hated, but you see today, you see them on bumper stickers. Yep. People even have them on T-shirts today. Yes. Is that the most visible symbol of Kansas City today? Or is there another icon that deserves credit? I've actually seen them in a couple of tattoos as well. So people are keeping them permanently yeah. with them. And you're them. not talking about yourself, Carol. No, I don't have that as a tattoo, no. But I think you could also look at the Liberty Memorial. You could look at, um, you know, our, our new Performing Arts Center as an up-and-coming symbol of the city. I think you could even take the skyline as a whole that's some that represents Kansas City, but really those shuttlecocks, something that um, kind of threw the Midwest for a loop, have really found a home here. Did you put a different symbol as the most iconic for Kansas City, Eric? The most Iconic, maybe the most racial probably would be the Nichols Fountain there on 47th Street. With, with Steve Krasky was still trying to get You see it on postcards. Don't get me started. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I see it on postcards, and I was somewhere a couple of weeks ago, and they had some postcards up, and that was one of the postcards that I saw there. So mm -hmm. I, I mean, I look at the downtown skyline, which obviously has come a long way, and that's certainly something to point to. But I, I know, is there value in this image, right? You think of the St. Louis, the Arch. I don't see, you think of the hottest cities in the country, Austin, Texas, uh, Denver, Colorado. There's not, you know, these places don't have images that define them. They have climates that define them, that bring people there. You're not going to be brought to a city by a logo. <laughs> While we honor those who have Some made outsized <laughs> contributions to our cities, like Sosland and Henry Block, we can't forget, of course, the countless lives lost this week, cut way short in length due to unabated violence. As we record this program, there have been 46 homicides in Kansas City. That means we're on track for the worst homicide rate in a decade. What are our candidates for mayor actually saying about that, Eric Wesson? Really nothing. It's not really a major topic. They're, they've shifted the conversation to housing, and they relate that to, to homicides and crime. But I don't know. I haven't heard any of them. I think Quentin has said something about uh, criminal justice reform, but what does that look like? Because that's at the tail end after a crime has been committed. What is the proactive approach to crime? Caroline. And I haven't heard any of, either one of them really say anything about that. Yeah, they haven't really called it out specifically. When I sat down with um, with Jolie and Quentin during the primary election, I was asking them about them, and they had more of a broad approach, very multifaceted, and that's what you've been hearing from city lawmakers, even statewide lawmakers, for a long time. It's like you can't just look at violence. You also must look at housing, income disparity, um, you know, education. So I think while we're not hearing an outright cry like we have several times from Sly James and the police chief, we're hearing a, a more rounded approach. You have had both of them on your program over the last few weeks. What were their solutions to crime, or did they offer any when they appeared with you, Pete? Uh, Quentin has mentioned, uh, obviously, criminal justice reform, a big part of his thing. I'm trying to get in increasements in uh, boots on the ground, so to speak, with more enforcement, but that's obviously a whole board issue. Uh, but one thing that's interesting is that you have this spike in crime year over over a year over the past five years, especially this year, and at no point have either of them who are sitting on the city council who have been partially in some way maybe responsible for this, uh, it's just interesting that there's not that outsider candidate who can say, this city, this mayor, this council has done a bad job. I'm the guy or gal to fix it. Well, and, and part of that is because there is no quick solution to this. Mm -hmm. Taking a broad 
evidence-based approach is not the wrong thing to do. Criminal experts will tell you it's a way to go. But you do get a sense, and I said this on the show before, Nick, that the community at large is simply out of energy, out of ideas, out of answers as to how to approach this situation. We're not hearing anything new from the police chief, from the mayor, from the city council right now. As the homicide count reaches the highest, uh, the fastest growing rate we've seen in a decade in this community, that's a big concern. And yet, where's the conversation? Where are we going here? I think uh, Chief Smith has brought back, I think Forte had the hot spots so they could kind of govern and do something about where the crime is. I think he's bringing that back. He just called it another name. But to, to get to his point about them not doing anything, I think I've seen Sly and I've watched him and talked to him. He has been trying to get Missouri lawmakers to do something about the concealed and carry because that was where the problem started. It's too many guns on the street. They're easy accessible. Their police can't really do a whole lot about them being on the street like that. So mm -hmm. I think they are doing anything. They're doing trying, something, but, that's but not, that's, that dog's not going to hunt. The General Assembly, this conservative General Assembly, is not going to pass gonna do anything right. Right. that restricts gun access. And so you have to go somewhere else. And on that note, nothing has changed in the past five years on that front that's seen this spike that you can point to that has caused this spike. So, I mean, there's a lot, to, a lot that goes into that. Well, let's head to Jefferson City next. A Kansas City lawmaker resigns his seat in the Missouri House this week after a renewed push to remove him from the legislature over sexual harassment allegations. Democrat Deron McGee was accused of attempting to engage in an unwanted sexual relationship with an employee he supervised. His resignation comes a year after Missouri Governor Eric Greitens resigned following allegations he tried to blackmail a woman he was having an affair with. In 2015, then House Speaker John Deal was forced to resign after sending sexually charged text messages to a 19-year-old intern. And a few months later, Independent Senator Paul Lavoda resigns after a pair of former interns accuse him of sexual harassment. I thought that the legislature in both parties were putting rules and procedures in place uh, to block this from happening, prevent it from happening. Does this say that this is a much larger issue than even lawmakers thought, Caroline? Well, I don't know if it says it's a larger issue, but what I think you could say is that the things and the safeguards and the, the rules that they've put in place worked. Yes, now, Duran, Duran McGee's investigation started right at the beginning of this legislative session. The Ethics Committee, which he was a member of, figured this out, looked at all the evidence, did it without a whole lot of fanfare and fuss, unlike what we saw with Governor Eric Greitens, although they sit in completely different levels in the state, you know, in, in the state government. Um, and they handled it, they issued it, and and he was he was exited out, even though he says he's leaving because he got a different yeah, job. Yeah, so he, he's city. saying he, he didn't actually necessarily do anything wrong here. He's got another job. Right. And But the report says, uh, in talking to the uh, staffer. She didn't feel threatened. There was nothing that she felt was inappropriate. It just got to a point where he was asking her for dates. But that's their part of the conversation. And I think the real issue probably with it was with the sanctions. I think that was the first offer in that investigation. The sanction was it violated policy for him to even ask her for a date. Right, but and I she felt uncomfortable with that part. Of as it. I was reading through what it said in the in the journal, um, that she may have also been fired because she did not want to get into a relationship with him, and that's really that big concern that we saw happening several years ago with um, you know some of these higher-ranking officials. Is ousted Kansas Congressman Kevin Yoder ready to try again? There are new stories this week that Yoder may be ready to win back the 3rd District seat. He lost to Democrat Sharice Davids. He files the paperwork with the Federal Election Commission to raise and spend money for a congressional candidacy. Yoda's former staffers say that doesn't mean he's going to run so okay. What does it mean, Pete? Uh, you know, I don't think it means anything. Okay. I think it's just legal <laughs> FEC nonsense, but I'll yes. say this. Uh, the minute Kevin Yoder lost to Sharice Davids and decided to get into lobbying was the minute you knew he was not running in 2020. Democrat or Republican, the easiest way to lose a primary is to go from politics to lobbying and then try to get back into politics. <laughs> so there's nothing more to this, Caroline? No, I I think all it does is it leaves the door open. It shows that I'm still here, but the fundraising, if he starts fundraising, that's going to show intent. He, he's not running. Pete's okay. got this exactly <laughs> right. Not running. All righty. If you're a major public figure, are you entitled to privacy? Now, there's a spat brewing this week over the most talked about celebrity in Kansas City, Patrick Mahomes, that after the Business Journal and a TV station 
show their readers and viewers the new multi-million dollar home he bought, plus exactly where the house is located. It's created quite the backlash, but are public figures entitled to privacy, Eric? They should be. They should be. Uh, but it depends on where he buys the house. If he buys it in a gated community, then he's got his privacy. But I think that we rise to a different level of people having access I, to I see that KNBC 9 News that actually listed his address apologizing this week. But if you went out to Los Angeles, they have Hollywood tours and they show you, hey, that's, that's Leonardo DiCaprio's house and, and that over there is Beyonce's house. Is it the same thing? Well, there are similarities, but this is not Hollywood, Nick. This is Kansas City and we have a different <laughs> sensibility yeah. here. I think a lot of people are really put off by this, that there's a sense the quarterback deserves his privacy and of course it's public record if people want to go and, right. and, and put it out out there, but this is not our the way we do things here in Kansas City. A lot of public figures have said for a long time that they appreciate the fact that they can sort of move through town without getting crushed, and this sort of violated that. If you're a celebrity, should you be expecting that you, some of your well, privacy may be invaded from time to time? Uh, you should, Nick, but also Patrick Mahomes has got to find himself. Lee Steinberg's a great agent. He's the guy that they based Jerry Maguire off of. But how he doesn't have somebody to set this thing up in an LLC so that you can't necessarily look up the name yeah. Patrick Mahomes, it's not on Patrick. His job is to throw the football, but it's on somebody's job on the legal financial side of his team to know better. We will be, by the way, showing you the front of the houses and addresses of all of our panelists. Mine's already Next on week's that. program, you can look at the dandelions in their yards and the older vehicles that reporters really actually drive. That is our Week in Review. Our thanks to our news reviewers. Keeping you up to date weekday mornings at 11 on KCUR FM, Steve Kraske, and from KCTV 5 News, Caroline Sweeney. Weekday mornings from 6 to 10 on KCMO Talk Radio, Pete Mundo, and on call at your Kansas City call, Eric Wesson. I'm Nick Haynes from all of us here at KCPT. Thanks for spending part of your weekend with us.